Hey everyone, I'm John Negroni, film editor for theyoungfolks.com, and I host the Cinemaholics podcast, so definitely check that out when you get a chance. I'm back again for a review of a new movie called Ghostbusters Afterlife, so let's just get right into it. So Ghostbusters Afterlife, it's the latest attempt to spark a blockbuster franchise out of the original 1984 classic film, Ghostbusters, which came to us from director Ivan Reitman. And that movie was so brilliant, you know, and how it blended action, comedy, and horror, all three of those genres, and uh, in, in such a unique and satisfying way, especially for the time. We hadn't really gotten a movie like Ghostbusters until that moment in 1984. There's a reason it's so beloved. I mean, to this day, many fans of the movie, at least by my estimation, still can't get over their obsession of the movie. And uh, hey, no judgment from me, you love what you love. But I have to be clear at the onset of this review and say that I've never been ride or die for Ghostbusters, but I am open-minded. I'm an open-minded fan of the series. I'm always willing to give one of these movies a go. So with Afterlife, well, first things first, Ghostbusters Afterlife is a very different attempt to revive the franchise, especially compared to the top-down reboot they did in 2016. In that movie, it did get mostly positive reviews from critics at the time, but it wasn't a major box office hit, at least the level of hit that Sony was apparently hoping for. I think that film made a little over like $200 million. Its budget, though, was really high. That's the thing. It was, I think it was like a $150 million budget, maybe a little less than that. And so it didn't really turn much of a profit. It might have broken even at best. And at the same time, you know, I think that film was unfairly scrutinized well before its release by trolls who they just wanted to bring the movie down for reasons that have nothing to do with the actual quality of the film. But for me, even when I watched it, I found it really unfunny, like painfully unfunny. I did not like the jokes and sense of humor in the movie. It felt like a very irritating studio comedy filled with studio comedy cliches, at least irritating for me, you know, and it had pointless jokes. I thought about like wontons and all this humor, like it felt like a low rent web series level of humor. I don't know. It just didn't work for me. And I'll say, look, Paul Feig's reboot, it was a good intentioned attempt, I think, to clean the slate, you know, do something totally different with the established mythology. Let's do Ghostbusters again, but in our own sort of, you know, modern way. What if Ghostbusters, but in the modern day? Sure. And that meant that it took place in a world where the original movie had never happened. Ghostbusters Afterlife is very, very different, however. It's a direct sequel or legacy revival sequel to the first film. It doesn't really mention Ghostbusters 2, by the way. It's kind of similar to how Jurassic World acts like the sequels. Not that they don't exist, but they may have happened, but it doesn't really matter one way or the other if they did. So in Ghostbusters Afterlife, it's 40 years later, or nearly 40 years, and the original prime Ghostbusting team, which was made up, of course, of Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson, and the late Harold Ramis, has long been split up. They've all gone their separate ways because, yeah, there simply haven't been any ghosts for them to deal with for decades. No one's seen a ghost in years, so their services are no longer required. They're off doing their own thing now. But Ghostbusters Afterlife isn't really about them, at least not directly. We mainly follow some new characters. We follow a down on their luck family of three who set out to inherit a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, which seems to have belonged at least to someone associated with the original Ghostbusters. Although the movie plays a little coy with who this is, but I think a lot of people will figure it out pretty fast. I, I don't think it's supposed to be that big of a surprise, but hey, maybe some people will find it surprising, so I will not give it away. Carrie Coon plays a single mother named Callie. I love Carrie Coon. She was wonderful in The Nest, and I guess other people might remember her from The Leftovers, uh, which I never got into, and hey, she was in Avengers Endgame too, a bunch of other good stuff. And so Callie, the single mother, has two quick-witted kids. The oldest one is Trevor. He's played by Finn Wolfhard, who just wants to flit around the small town during the summer. They even named the town Somerville as if that weren't on the nose enough. And yeah, so Trevor, he wants to fix up a car so he can impress his new co-worker at the burger shop. And I, I will say that there isn't anything made about how this is the guy from It, right? The two It movies. But he was also in Stranger Things and he once dressed up as a Ghostbuster in Stranger Things. I think it was the second season. 
don't worry, there's no weird jokes like remarking on that. It's just a little bit of fun trivia you can keep for yourself if you, I don't know, maybe you forgot. Anyway, the, the film's true point of view character, interestingly enough, is the other sibling, Phoebe. And she is played by McKenna Grace, who is a socially awkward 12-year-old. She's obsessed with science, and she tells really bad jokes, but in a funny way. And again, it's it's not exactly hard to figure out. Like, once you kind of look at her and, and hear her and kind of experience her personality, it's not that hard to figure out, like, who these kids are supposed to be related to. But the good news is that, at least in my opinion, I think they're plenty compelling to watch, whether you know that information or not. It's just something extra. And the family notices right away that there's something really off about this farmhouse. First of all, it looks extremely spooky. They've just moved into it and weird things are starting to happen. The town itself has a lot of weird goings on. There are these bizarre earthquakes that happen on a daily basis. No one in town knows why they're happening and scientifically speaking as is explained in the film they shouldn't be happening at all and so phoebe she's a very ever she's ever curious you know she's the scientist she decides to recruit some help from a few people in town some locals and hopefully figuring out where these supposedly supernatural mysteries are coming from she first gets in touch with her summer school teacher played by paul rudd and paul rudd great addition i think to this movie he's doing his usual humble likable every man kind of character from films like Ant-Man and I Love You Man. It's not the most creative, surprising thing we've ever seen from him, but hey, it's a good zone for him to be in, so I was happy to see it in this movie. He's warm, he's vivacious, it's what we expect from Paul Rudd at this point, and I'm totally fine with the movie delivering on that sort of thing, even if it isn't all that different. Phoebe herself also brings in a fellow schoolmate actually named Podcast It who, you guessed it, has a podcast and he's obsessed with conspiracy theories. And okay, look, on paper, someone named Podcast showing up in a Ghostbusters movie, like this should be the most annoying character of the year. (laughs) At least least, I would assume so. But surprisingly, he's played so well and with so much smooth quirkiness by this newcomer, Logan Kim. He has the confidence of an actor who's been making movies since he could crawl, yet this is remarkably his first film ever. So I'm a big fan of this kid. Afterlife was directed by Jason Reitman. He's the son of Ivan Reitman, of course, the original director of the film, or the film, the director of the original Ghostbusters film. And yeah, I mean, the narrative behind this movie easily writes itself. It's a passing of the torch from the old Ghostbusters director to the new, but also the old canon to the new generation. It's a theme that a lot of these revival sequels tend to have. Force Awakens, take your pick. And in many ways, it's it's a respectful tribute, I think, to what I consider a very good movie that other people seem to worship for reasons I've never fully understood, but I have no issue with. I actually find it odd that, you know, I I find it odd what people appear to get out of that first film. Sometimes I get the feeling like people take that first film or take it as like a, a serious, epic blockbuster with all this emotion and grandstanding, but I don't know. I've always found it to be a humble, funny, and pretty entertaining romp about a group of friends starting a business, but they have to overcome the frustrations of bureaucracy, and it's extra funny because all these ghosts and gadgets are involved, and it's like, it's extra. It makes the, the film even more exciting and different, but the bones of it, that sort of like, let's start a business, but everything goes wrong, that on its own is really fun, but then all that extra stuff ghost stuff makes it even more different and interesting. Still, it is nice to see Jason Reitman put his own stamp on the material and make a new kind of Ghostbusters movie. I think if he had tried to make another 1984 version of the movie but do it in the modern day, which is what the 2016 reboot did, I don't think it would have worked this well. I, I really don't. And I don't think he would have been able to do it right. So he really is kind of just trying to make his own version of what he would like to see in a Ghostbusters movie. And I respect that choice. I think that's the right choice to make with this franchise if we really are going to keep it going. The film, I think, is actually at its best when it flows like a Jason Reitman movie, which I really like Jason Reitman movies. So example, it has the dry humor in its characters, same as kind of like we see in Up in the Air with the George Clooney movie with Anna Kendrick. And it has prickly, but still kind of breezy chemistry between the family members like we see in Juno. And I really do think the central family is key to what I think makes this movie work. They're very easy to find investing. They each have their own idiosyncrasies, if I can say that. 
but they also have like a shared language. Like when they talk to each other, you get the feeling they've known each other a long time. They understand who the other person is. It really is impressive, I think, how Reitman, throughout much of his work, he really just understands and gets the way that families talk and relate to one another. And I think it serves this story really well because this story is about broken families trying to repair themselves after years of misunderstandings and hardship and not getting each other. And it's really odd because I enjoyed Ghostbusters Afterlife at its most when it wasn't about the ghosts or busting them or whatever. And in fact, it falls apart rather quickly, like once the whole thing becomes yet another third act frenzy to stop a big world changing crisis, despite so much of the lead up being, I thought enjoyably small and accessible, it has to switch into something big and epic. And I think it loses a lot of its earned goodwill and energy by the time all the action and mayhem has to let itself loose. Though I will admit there is a set piece near the middle of the movie that is probably when the whole thing peaks, it features a very thrilling car chase with some practical effects too. They're trying to catch a metal eating ghost justice for muncher and it's kind of small stakes but it's creative and it's unpredictable unlike a lot of the rest of the movie i wish more of the movie was like that and the other issue with this film and, and where it will i think divide many many people i predict is the heavy-handed use of nostalgia and how reitman and his co-screenwriter gil keenan handle a lot of the callbacks and references to the 1984 film again i'm not the biggest fan of that movie i've only seen it maybe two or three times so i, I doubt i caught even half of all the easter eggs but i could tell they were happening i just wasn't catching them specifically and look i can imagine someone going in and watching this movie without noticing all the little references and i think they'll either feel overwhelmed or overjoyed depending on something as uncontrollable as their mood that day i would probably feel overwhelmed if i were them because i just want to watch a new movie i, I don't want so many consecutive scenes relying almost entirely on me recognizing something from something else especially a movie that came out so long ago this type of filmmaking while certainly potent for its established fan base and very satisfying for them can so easily alienate people who don't know why they should care. So it is a shortcoming, but I'll be clear, it's not a death blow to the film's quality, at least for me. Without giving anything away, the ending really pushes the nostalgia bait in a territory that a lot of people might find indefensible. And look, I didn't mind it much, but I did find some of the jokes and the timing to be unusually awkward and a little off-putting, at least unusual in the sense that it feels a bit off compared to the rest of the movie's sharp precision. I got the feeling that they didn't have enough time to film it or something because it just doesn't have that same finesse that so much of the rest of the movie has. And the movie really wants me to cry. <laughs> like it, it really wants the audience to cry, but I, I, it didn't move me, honestly. And I don't think I felt what the filmmakers wanted me to feel. I was kind of checked out by the very end, but again, I wasn't bored. I wasn't hating it or anything like that. I liked the film, and in spite of all these pretty obvious indulgences, and that's probably because I happen to respond quite positively to Reitman's characters and the way he writes characters. So even if they're in a movie that, you know, or if they're even if they're in a movie I don't love on its own, I'll still follow along. I'll have a good enough time seeing what mischief these people are going to get into and how they'll try to get out of it. And yeah, there will probably be more of these Ghostbuster films coming down the line. How could there not? I think it's tracking well at the box office. And hey, look, fortunately, this movie provides enough decent foundation for making the next one maybe a little more polished and independently minded. But for now, I'm not going to be answering the call for any more Ghostbusters movies. Yeah, I did that. Um, yeah, unless they really start making an effort to kind of just move on a little and focus more on the future of the franchise instead of the past, especially when they don't even seem to really appreciate what was really all that great about the past in the first place. So Ghostbusters Afterlife, it's coming out in theaters on November 19th. Be sure to see it for yourself before you have an opinion about it. And I hope this review was helpful, even if you disagree with it. All right, that's it for me uh, for this one. I have other stuff I need to get to. I still need to do King Richard. Uh, that is a really good film. I saw Red Rocket this past week, and I can't wait to talk about that movie unbelievably excited to talk about red rocket and hopefully licorice pizza coming down the line to house of gucci lots of films coming so as usual hit up the comments if there's something specific you want me to see that i haven't said that i'm going to see yet but until next time